Rothlings, and welcome to Space Week Live for Sunday, April 11th, 2021. We are back, we meaning I, am back for the uh, first time in three weeks. I've been in the process of moving, and um, uh, I am moved into my new house. I'm still surrounded by boxes, but uh, we're getting there. I don't yet have my studio set up, and in fact, in the background, you can see that I don't even have my window blinds. Um, uh, bought yet. I've just got a towel in the window, but uh, got some space goodies behind me, and uh, I'll have more set up in the future. I'm looking forward to figuring out, uh, sorry, looking forward to figuring out uh, where to put stuff, what to paint the walls, and um, all that good stuff. So uh, I wanted to show you uh, my new house. So that's that's where I live now. Uh, it's a nice place. It's a lot smaller than my old house, but um, uh, it'll do the job nicely. And I'm looking forward to building this place out uh, and decorating it according to my own personal whims. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, let me see. We have a lot of ground to cover. I want to uh, catch up on the past three weeks of space happenings. So let's get started. Um, three weeks ago. All right. Back on March 22nd, uh, a Rocket Lab Electron rocket, they go up so fast, launched with small satellites for Photon, the Black Sky Global Se Series, Centaur 3, Miriota 7, Viri Hatchling, M2, and Gunsmoke 7. Let's check that out. Ten, nine, eight, seven, Ten, nine, six, six, five, four, three, two... <laughs> Everything good there. No, no issues with the launch. Um, no, no recovery attempt. But uh, well, that's all right. They're still working on that, f that uh, functionality. Then on March 23rd was the ri oh, this is not a video. It's a picture. <laughs> on March 23rd was the ribbon cutting of the Delta II rocket exhibit at Kennedy Space Center's Rocket Garden. Uh, Delta II was called the workhorse because during its long and storied career. It delivered 24 GPS satellites, 60 Iridium satellites, the Kepler and Spitzer space telescopes, 
both stereo satellites for solar imaging, and a bunch of space probes, including the Near Asteroid Probe, 2001 Mars Odyssey Orbiter, the Dawn Mission for studying Vesta and Ceres, Deep Impact, Deep Space One, the Mars Climate Orbiter, Mars Global Surveyor, Mars Pathfinder Rover, Mars Phoenix Lander, Mars Polar Lander, and both Mars Exploration Rovers, Spirit and Opportunity, may they rest in peace. Uh, a real um, icon of, of uh, space exploration, the Delta II rocket. Then on March 24th, SpaceX launched another batch of 60 Starlink satellites. Oddly, there was no verbal countdown from the presenter this time. Track forward here to the landing. If I can get my coffee beverage out of the way. Where's that pesky landing? Entry burn, okay. There's a few up our There we go. Yeah, SpaceX has been having a lot of video cutouts lately. I mean, they're pretty normal for drone ship landings, but we had a run of, of quite a few uh, landings where the video did not cut out. Um, you know, I, I don't know why they... I mean, uh, presumably they have another ship in the area, or, or they could have uh, a drone hovering nearby. Uh, but, uh, you know, they, um, they, they give us something, and that's, that's good. Uh, and then the uh, the satellite deployment proceeded nominally, as expected, with the 60 Starlink satellites fanning out, um, uh, being uh, sort of propelled by centrifugal force uh, as they slowly rotate the uh, the uh, upper rocket stage. Then on March 24th. SpaceX launch, oh, yeah, I'm sorry, also on the 24th, Russia's GK Launch Services, who handles their commercial launches, uh, launched a Soyuz 2.1B with the fifth batch of OneWeb internet satellites from far eastern Vostochny Cosmodrome. And uh, this time we're going to be able to enjoy a daytime launch when we launch in December it was a night launch, so let's look at it from a different perspective. Enjoy the launch. We have very exciting. So today we are launching in plane 7 of our constellation. Uh, beautiful launch and um, no, no issues there. Um, I must say though, I personally am not a fan of the, um, uh, the, the OneWeb broadcasts because they... Uh, well, okay, so uh, I have a positive and a negative, so I'll start with the negative. Um, I'm not a fan of broadcasts where the announcers just jabber on and on, uh, even talking up to the moment of and even through the, uh, the ignition. Uh, I'm, I'm a fan of just shut up and, and watch the thing launch. But, <laughs> you know, uh, to each their own. Um, you know, OneWeb is, uh, uh, I think OneWeb was bought out by the British government, wasn't it? Anyway, uh, they experienced a bankruptcy and then last year they were, or last year, and then they were bailed out. But um, uh, yeah, now the positive, uh, we actually got, look at this, 
we actually got dual uh, rocket cam live views from the Soyuz rocket as it ascended, which um, Soyuz rockets regularly do have rocket cams, but uh, Roscosmos doesn't broadcast those feeds live. You know, so, for example, we saw the rocket cam footage after the the Soyuz MS-10 anomaly where the uh, the booster failed to uh, jettison correctly and, and the crew uh, was sort of sent careening off into a, a, a ballistic, um, you know, return back to Earth, uh, which, you know, they it aborted successfully and they landed safely, but the, the launch was not successful. Um, but we didn't get to see those views live. They, they posted them after the fact. So, uh, yeah, this time we actually got to see the live rocket cam views, which was very cool. So kudos to OneWeb for that. Or to uh, GK Launch Services, I guess, would be... would be. Uh, I don't know whose decision that was, but... <laughs> probably GK, because they're the Russian handler of the commercial launches. But, uh, anyway, moving on. Um, oops. Oh, yes. Then on March 30th, the starship that shall not be named, except I will name it, SN-11. Fate decreed that the South Texas coast would be blanketed in pea soup fog that morning, so nobody actually got to see the launch. Um, this wasn't SpaceX's first time launching in thick fog. There was a Falcon 9 launch from Vandenberg in California a year or two ago that was similarly obscured. Uh, but let's take a look at the highlights. Ten, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, two, one. Lift off. So the uh, the launch. And the well, we couldn't see the launch, but the telemet telemetrically, the if that's a word, the uh, the launch uh, looked good. Uh, the ascent looked okay, except they they had you can see that there's a fire on the engine there, um, and I don't know if that's the fire that caused an issue later, but if we track forward here to um, um, okay, so it ascended to 10 kilometers performed the belly flop maneuver, and then descended back down. Um, wow, they lost... Oh, okay. They, they lost video footage a few times during the broadcast. It was kind of strange. Um, and then... There's no land to be seen because there's just an endless cloud bank. Um, T plus 545, we've just so descent, and then that's that's it. Uh, <laughs> that's the last frame we get from uh, from SN11 as it as it uh, uh, begins its um, uh, its landing burn. Well, that landing never happened, at least not in one piece. Uh, a methane leak caused a fire on Raptor engine number two and fried the avionics, which resulted in a hard start in the methane turbo pump during the attempted landing burn. Uh, that means there was a hard start means there was too much fuel in the combustion chamber at ignition uh, and the pressure was too high. The result was violent. Uh, SN11 exploded in midair. Uh, raining rocket debris, debris across a large area and nearly taking out the cameras of Lab Padre, Everyday Astronaut, and others. Uh, because of the fog, no one actually saw the explosion, clearly. They just saw the glow from it. Uh, however, we can see and hear the aftermath uh, in this incredible footage, courtesy of Cosmic Perspective. And I hope I don't have to cut this bit out of the... Uh, the video for for copyright, but um, I wanted to show you this because it's really incredible.
almost like a scene from a war movie. So um, fortunately, you know, we do have we did have third parties on the ground, uh, multiple third parties on the ground with HD cam UHD cameras and binaural audio and everything else to capture the uh, apocalyptic sequence there. But uh, um, yeah, so rest in peace, SN11, and let's please move on and not, not do that again. Uh, and in typical Elon Musk fashion, after the incident, he uh, um, he just rolled with it, tweeting that they would fix it six ways from Sunday. So let's hope that they're able to to pull that off. Uh, also on the 30th, um, a Chinese Long March 4C launched the Gaofen 1202 Earth Observation Satellite from Zhuquan Launch Center in the Gobai Desert of remote northwest China. As with, as with all Earth uh, observation satellites, uh, the primary purpose is uh, disaster recovery, agriculture management, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, at least the stated purpose. Uh, but you know, it's a it's a it's a Earth observation satellite, so it will probably also be used for spying purposes. Uh, anywho. <laughs> um, then that brings us to last week. So there's been a lot going on. Um, boop. On Monday, ISS astronauts Mike Hopkins, Victor Glover, Suichi Noguchi, and Shannon Walker boarded the SpaceX Crew Dragon Crew-1 Resilience and relocated it from the Harmony Module's forward port to the Zenith, or space-facing port. That's the port away from the Earth. Uh, this will enable the upcoming Crew-2 mission to dock to the forward port. I don't actually know why this relocation was necessary. Uh, maybe the forward port has something, some feature that the Zenith port doesn't that's needed for incoming Crew Dragons. I'm not actually sure. But, uh, so that's been two relocations done recently. There was also, a few weeks ago, there was a uh, Soyuz relocation from, uh, from uh, I think, Rasviet to Poisk or something like that. Um, then last Tuesday, NASA conducted a low height splashdown test of an Orion crew capsule test article. Um, this is not a production craft that will actually fly on uh, SLS, but it is a, a test article uh, at Langley Research Center. Let's check that out. Woohoo! <laughs> um, the test might have looked underwhelming, but the purpose of these tests is to gather data about Orion's performance during splashdowns uh, at various speeds and angles. So later on they'll do a higher uh, altitude or, or a drop from a higher height, uh, and they also uh, have done and will do um, uh, oblique entry tests where they swing the craft down at an angle and impact the water. Uh, but it'll be on when it, uh, during the actual um, uh, Artemis missions, Orion will be dangling on parachutes and so it'll actually only impact oop, nice, my outro. Uh, it'll actually only impact the water at between 10 and 20 miles per hour, uh, whatever that is in kilometers. Um, so it doesn't need to be dropped from a very high height. And then, uh, actually that same day, uh, NASA ran another test 
a static firing of a single RS-25 developmental engine, which will be used on an SLS rocket. Uh, the test ran for a full 500 seconds. Let's check out a few seconds of it. RS-25 is always a pleasure to, uh, to behold. It's, a, it's a, a beautiful and elegant engine. It burns hydrogen and oxygen. The product is pure water vapor, and, uh, and it burns very cleanly with a nice, uh, clean and consistent flame, well-formed. Uh, it's, it's really, um, really an admirable rocket engine. Then... On Wednesday, SpaceX launched yet another batch of Starlink satellites, bringing the total number currently in orbit to 1,381. Falcon 9 is configured for flight. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. Ignition. And lift off. Uh, Chris V, that's 1,381, uh, if my current count is accurate. And uh, there, but there are more than that that have been launched, but um, but the, uh, some of the first few were deorbited either for testing purposes or, or there were a few that failed to attain their target orbits. But, uh, yep, so nominal launch, nominal release, um, another long coast phase for this mission. Where is the release? Now be throttling down the engines, the M1D engines do have a visual of... And there they go. Stage. Forward unto dawn, <laughs> or now again, this dusk. Looks like dawn. So shortly, they will deploy their solar array, and over the next few days, little halo reference there. Um, so it's strange to think that although Starlink represents roughly one quarter of all operational satellites orbiting the Earth, more than four times as many as Planet Labs, the next biggest satellite constellation, Starlink is still in the beta testing phase. Although they might have a lot of pre-purchased deposits, uh, for example, my own deposit. Uh, hey, look at that. Um, Meeting that warmer human here, let's just... Not many uh, here. Let's give you some rocket views. There. Okay. Um, Although they might have a lot of pre-purchased deposits, they don't have very many monthly paying customers yet, presumably. And that's 24 Falcon 9 launches, each of which uh, costs SpaceX an estimated $15 million, uh, although the, the external retail customer cost is $62 million. The internal cost is estimated to be approximately $15 million. And more than 1,400 total Starlink satellites. Some of the early ones were deorbited, like I mentioned earlier, at roughly <clears throat> roughly $250,000 each. That's at least, at the very least, $720 million total investment so far in the Starlink program. And they're just getting started. Uh, fortunately, SpaceX is a busy and cost-effective launch provider. Elon Musk is the second or first richest person in the world on paper, depending on which week you look at the numbers. And um, Tesla is booming, uh, and they, there, there is some... some I'm, I'm not sure to what degree, uh, you know, it's not public knowledge or whatever, but uh, uh, there is the potential for cross-pollination there between Tesla and SpaceX, and there's no indication that any of them are slowing down. So... I signed up for Starlink Beta a couple months ago, paying my 
my $99 deposit. And uh, unfortunately, though, I live, well, fortunately, but also unfortunately, I live in a well-served urban area. So who knows if and when I'll become eligible for Starlink service. But if I ever do get my own dishy McFlatface, I'll make sure to stream the next Starlink launch over my Starlink internet connection for you. Uh, just because redundancy is redundant and awesome. <laughs> then on Thursday, uh, a Chinese Long March 4B rocket launched the Xi'an 603 satellite from Taiyuan Satellite Launch Center. Then finally, on Friday, a Russian Soyuz 2.1A launched Expedition 65 crew, uh, Mark van de Hei, Oleg Novit Novitsky, Novitsky, and Pyotr Dubrov to the ISS, where they'll spend approximately six months. Second umbilical tower separate. And we see booster ignition. Engines at maximum thrust. And liftoff. So use MS-18 on its way to the International Space Station. And then skipping forward to the uh, some of the dock or some of the rendezvous and docking coverage, where we had uh, a lot of really beautiful Earth views in the background. Uh, during their daytime approach. And uh, let's see, I'm not sure where in the world that was. Looks like either Australia or Africa. Uh, let's see. At one point, the um, the view from the Soyuz started like s rotating dramatically, and it was uh, a little tr a little disconcerting to see. But it was, I guess, all according to plan. It was the their nominal approach. I guess it was, I don't know, reorient reorienting itself or something. But um, uh, there were no concerns expressed in the in the commentation. So. Uh, oh yes, and uh, after after the launch, docking uh, was just three hours later because uh, Baikonur is ideally situated for a rapid um, ascent uphill to the uh, uh, to the ISS. So then um, they okay. So then there was the hatch opening. Uh, I don't know who it was. Somebody, when they came through the hatch, I don't know if they were playing a joke, but they were actually wearing a... Um, <laughs> they were actually wearing a mask <laughs> to the ISS, which is funny because they all of the crew had already been in quarantine. And so um, um, he came through, and that's one of the Russian cosmonauts. And hey, <laughs> da -da -da. so from mask to birthday cap, I guess. Uh, we. I think that was Pyotr. Uh, I think it's, it's, this was his first flight to space, so he was excited. Um, and uh, rightfully so. All right, looking ahead to this week, uh, let's actually take a look back at some space history. So today marks the 51st anniversary of the launch of Apollo 13 the famous mission that experienced the oxygen tank explosion and had to return to Earth. Astronauts James Lovell, Jack Swigert, and Fred Hayes launched <clears throat> in their Saturn V on April 11, 1970. The oxygen tank incident occurred on the 14th, then they swung around the moon on the 15th and splashed down on the 17th. That's a fast return from the moon. Normally it takes four days, but um, uh, 
I'm guessing because they they uh, uh, were able to basically slingshot around the moon, they fast-tracked their return trajectory toward Earth. Uh, then tomorrow, April 12th, will mark the 40th anniversary of STS-1, the first space shuttle flight with mission commander John Young and pilot Robert Crippen. Then on Friday, April 16th, we have another Apollo anniversary. It'll, it'll mark 49 years since the launch of Apollo 16 with astronauts John Young, T. Kenneth Mattingly, and Charles Duke. That is, in fact, the same John Young who went on to command STS-1 nine years later. So it's uh, John Young week, or it's uh, Young week uh, this week. And... Um, the Apollo 16 mission, so Apollo 11 was uh, short and sweet, uh, you know, boots on the ground, plant the flag, collect some rocks, call the president, and or receive the call from the president and then take off again. But um, future Apollo or subsequent Apollo missions got to stay much longer. And uh, Apollo 16 lasted a full 11 days, and the crew were able to spend more than 20 hours on EVAs walking around on the lunar surface, which... Uh, was an in, uh, incredible experience for them. Uh, getting back to the present, on Wednesday, April 14th, at a time to be determined, there might be a Blue Origin New Shepard suborbital, suborbital launch. Uh, stay tuned for an update on the time. Blue Origin doesn't usually give us a lot of advance warning before, they, uh, before their New Shepard launches. And then also, no earlier than Wednesday the 14th, and this is the one you've all been waiting for. <laughs> um, uh, but probably probably on a later date, but at possibly as early as the 14th, uh, there might be the highly anticipated first flight of the Ingenuity helicopter drone on Mars. That flight had been scheduled for tomorrow the 12th, but there was an issue during a high-speed spin test of Ing Ingenuity's rotors on Friday. Uh, the command sequence controlling the test ended early due to a watchdog timer expiration as it was trying to transition the flight computer from pre-flight to flight mode. Ingenuity remains safe and healthy, and there are no problems with its telemetry communication. Uh, the watchdog timer oversees the command sequence and alerts the system to any potential issues. Um, kind of like the... Uh, the the automated launch sequences of, of many rockets. It'll shut things down if it detects anything out of out of uh, out of uh, what do they call it? Out of family or uh, off nominal. Uh, so NASA is reviewing the data. Once they fully understand what happened, they will push out a fix if needed, reschedule, reschedule the full speed test, and pin down a date for the first flight which, again, may be as early as Wednesday, but I am guessing will be pushed uh, later. We'll just have to wait and see. Then on Thursday, April 15th at 3.45 p.m. Eastern, 9.45... Oh, I'm so sorry. I meant to give you this graphic. Um, actually, it's not a graphic. It's an actual uh, um, uh, selfie and... Uh, GIF <laughs> of uh, perseverance and ingenuity on the surface of Mars. So ingenuity is able to um, take selfies with its various cameras. And uh, so there, I'll leave you with that while I talk about the next event. So on Thursday, April 15th at 3.45 p.m. Eastern, 1945 GMT, astronaut Shannon Walker will take over command of the International Space Station from Sergei Rizhikov. I won't have a live stream for you here, but you can either watch it on NASA TV, or you can watch the replay, which will, uh, which will happen during my undocking live stream on Friday. Then on Friday, April 16th, at 5.45 p.m. Eastern, 21.45 GMT, coverage begins for the closing of the hatch on Soyuz MS-17 as it prepares to depart the ISS with crew members Kate Rubens, Sergei Rizhikov and Sergei Kudsverchkov, uh, who have been on, on board ISS for the last few months. Undocking coverage begins three and a half hours later at 9.15 p.m. Eastern, 01.15 GMT, and will continue through landing in Kazakhstan near Jezkazgan 
at approximately 12.56 a.m. Eastern, 0456 GMT. Uh, that is it for uh, the catch-up and the coming week. Uh, I would like to welcome our new channel member, Asman BJ Asman. Uh, if you would like to become a member and support the, uh, the uh, content I provide for you, Space Weeks, the, the live streams of, of launches and other events, and assorted other space-related goodies, um, the, uh, just click the, click the join button and, and do your thing. <laughs> um, let's see. Oh yeah. 97 K. Uh, the channel has reached 97,000 subscribers. So thank you all very much for your <clears throat> undying support. The climb has been somewhat slow, but, uh, but steady. And, um, um, Looking forward to 100K. Not sure when it'll happen, but <clears throat> it will happen relatively soon. Um, especially if there are any big uh, any big live events that because the, the the subs always come in during um, big live streams. That's that's when the, uh, I get the most subs. But uh, yeah, looking forward to that. And I'll have something for you uh, once I reach 100K because that's a big milestone for any channel. Um, and, and that represents, you know, a lot of, a lot of hard work uh, on the part of, of myself, my moderators, um, you know, collaborators, uh, partners, etc. And, uh, that'll be, that'll be a great day for us. Uh, and then finally, let's get to your questions. Uh, which we probably have. Okay, yeah, we have quite a few here. Uh, also, thanks especially to Chris V for compiling these questions for me. Um, okay, so uh, Kenochi Turtle Dove, do you think the idea of Percy ingenuity could be done, say, on Jupiter? Um, well, uh, the thing, the thing, the the main problems with pro Jupiter probes is. Uh, there is no available solid surface for us to land on. There are endless miles of clouds, and uh, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> with uh, a, a certain crushing death of uh, of uh, you know atmosphere and gravity. You know, well before we we get to any kind of uh, possible solid surface that may be down there at the core of Jupiter. Um, Jupiter and the second problem is radiation. Jupiter generates a huge amount of radiation, uh, and well, Ju I should just say, Jupiter generates a huge magnetic field, and uh, the most powerful in the solar system besides the Sun by far, and uh, that magnetic field or that magnetosphere um, traps a huge amount of solar radiation, so there is a sort of a, a bath of high energy, you know, ionizing radiation particles swimming around Jupiter. And it makes it a very tricky place for, um, for probes in general. And, um, you know, yeah. So we can't land on Jupiter. Uh, it may be possible to uh, float something in the atmosphere, but I'm not sure what kind of materials or sizes would be required for that because Jupiter has uh, an enormous gravitational pull uh, and so you know you're not going to be able to to um, you would need I mean and Jupiter is also primarily hydrogen um, and helium right kind of like a star so um, <clears throat> you would need something more buoyant than hydrogen, which there isn't anything. <clears throat> Excuse me. Frogs in my throat. Since helium is, the, I mean, since hydrogen is the lightest gas, uh, yeah, it may not be possible to float in the clouds of Jupiter because there may not be a substance which would provide any buoyancy. Um, also, the atmosphere of Jupiter is notoriously very turbulent uh, with, you know, storms raging at 
hundreds or thousands of miles per hour. Um, interesting question, though. Mark Desaire. I think large balloons might be a better idea floating in the atmosphere. Okay, we sort of addressed that. The Penguin Brother. They aren't doing SN13 and SN14. They're going straight to SN15. So the next uh, Starship serial number to launch is expected to be uh, SN15. And yeah, let's get back to full screen. Um, I do not know. I am. I'm. I've been too busy and uh, juggling too many things to keep track of um, specific pro progress on specific Starship serial numbers uh, or test article serial numbers. But um, uh, I'm not sure what happened with SN13 and 14. Um, but yeah, the next one that is planned to launch is, so far as I have heard, SN15. Uh, Sam Valashek, at this point, uh, what is SLS's goal? Private industry will probably be better than SLS, despite its huge, bu huge budget and long development time. Uh, so SLS, yeah. Um, SLS is a polarizing topic. Uh, because it it has had a huge budget uh, with cost overruns and delays, and um, there are many who see it as uh, just a cash cow for certain states to reap government dollars for you know uh, space jobs and uh, you know cost plus contracts and so on and so forth with little actual, you know, promise of, 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 uh, of, of a functioning mission, you know, a little actual uh, prospect of, of accomplishing the stated goal of, of getting back to the moon uh, with the first woman and the next man. <laughs> but, um, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I don't get political on that, on that front. Uh, I hope for its success because, I mean, a huge amount has been invested in it um, and it the rocket certainly has the capability to get us there. Uh, I mean, it will be the most powerful rocket until super heavy. Um, but, uh, hmm, yeah, I think that uh, it is likely that at least Artemis 1 will launch. Uh, that's a, an unmanned mission around the moon. As for the future Artemis missions that will land us on the moon, I sure hope they happen, but it, it still remains to be seen. There's still a lot of work to be done, you know, because a lot of the systems that, that are in use are uh, being outsourced, you know, like the lunar landers are, are going to be commercial, uh, uh, you know, landers like the Blue Origin or whatever. Um, and uh, the, the Lunar Gateway, I mean, I believe that uh, some components of the Lunar Gateway will be launched later this year, but uh, it, it, you know, it doesn't exist yet and it's essential for the, for the stated plan of, of um, you know, the, the Artemis program, but, um, I don't know. I don't like to, I don't like to pretend like I have a crystal ball, but I, I hope that, that Artemis succeeds and that SLS gets us back to the moon because I hate inefficiency. I really hate inefficiency and, um, spending billions upon billions of dollars <clears throat> on a mission that never happens is horrible. And it hurts the entire spaceflight industry. If that would, it would hurt the entire spaceflight industry were that to happen, because, um, you know, it, it's just money thrown down the tubes. Um, I might sneeze in a moment. Please pardon me. Oh boy! I'll try to mute it if I do. Uh, all right. So Gary Smith asks, what's the goal for the number of Starlink satellites? So the reason why we need so many, so many Starlink satellites, uh, we're currently at, you know, almost 1400 operational satellites. Um, 
The plan is for 12,000 or 42,000, depending on... I, don't, I actually don't know if that 42,000 number ever got approved by uh, either the international governing body or the FAA uh, in the U.S. Uh, I should look that up so that I can answer that question uh, intelligently. But um, uh, but there's going to be a lot, uh, you know. So the, the the as big as the constellation is, there's going to be a lot more. Uh, so the reason why they need a lot is because they are in low Earth orbit. You know, anywhere between 250 and 450 or 500 miles uh, above the surface of the Earth. So, um, uh, you know, most, like, satellite internet is provided by geostationary satellites that are 22,000 miles from the Earth and uh, have you know, limited capacity for large numbers of users and also because of their distance uh, have a, uh, a high latency because of simply the time it takes for light to travel that distance uh, you know like a, a quarter second or something round trip uh, or a, a, a not not insignificant fraction of a second and um, and so these low earth orbit constellations like Starlink and OneWeb which will be a much smaller constellation um, they have a much smaller footprint whereas a, a, a geostationary satellite can view can see roughly half the earth at any given time well all the time the same half of the earth um, uh, low Earth orbit satellites can only see, you know, to a horizon of maybe a thousand or fifteen hundred miles away, and uh, you know, so and they're constantly moving just because of the nature of orbital mechanics. Uh, they they they're not stationary; they're always on the move. And so, in order to provide constant and overlapping coverage for any given area, you need multiple bands of satellites. You know. Um, multiple rings of satellites orbiting um, in a sort of grid uh, fashion, so that any given spot on the ground within the cover within the the uh, coverage area always has at least one or multiple uh, Starlink satellites. You know, kind of like GPS. You need multiple GPS satellites in order to get a GPS position. You're going to need uh, multiple Starlink satellites. Um, in your sky in order to maintain your internet connection. Um, and I am not a rocket scientist, so I don't have a deep knowledge of uh, orbital mechanics and, and like the reasons why there are, like they're choosing the specific orbital shells that they are uh, or the orbital inclinations that they are. But um, you know, the basic idea is because Earth is really big, and low Earth orbit has a limited horizon, and you need multiple satellites uh, above your horizon constantly in order to maintain your your connection. Um, let's see. MVM Motovlog Music. Do you think SpaceX Starship will land unmanned on the moon before Artemis? Hmm. I suspect not. Uh, I don't think so, because SpaceX's target is not the moon. SpaceX's target is Mars. Uh, they want to go. They want to fly around the moon. There's the Dear Moon mission with uh, uh, Yusaku Maezawa, but um, that's just a sort of a, a very expensive and uh, aesthetically pleasing joyride um, versus you know. Uh, like a legitimate scientific mission. I mean, it's legitimate, but it's not. It's not a exploration mission. It's a. It's a, a commercial, you know, PR mission. Um, and so I don't know that SpaceX has any plans to land Starship on the Moon at all. Um, I could be wrong on that, but that's, yeah, th that's not what they're working toward currently. So uh, I don't think that that would happen before Artemis. Sam Valashek, each Starlink station costs $1,500 $1, 
dollars, while SpaceX charges customers only four ninety nine for the base, <clears throat> resulting in an approximate one thousand dollar loss per customer to start with. Uh, that's quite possible. I haven't seen those. Like, I'm not sure what the source on that is, and I haven't seen those numbers for myself, but, um, uh, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if the initial uh, rollout involves some lost leaders of, uh, you know, some uh, you know, initial, initial, whatever, loss on the part of SpaceX. Uh, but once, once they get going, it should be an incredibly pro profitable enterprise. Um, especially, you know, especially if there can be like millions or hundreds of millions of people using the Starlink uh, constellation, that's a lot of revenue for SpaceX. Gary Smith, so they will set up a web of beta satellites, and when they get the thing working, they will deorbit them and put up a network of working satellites? No, no, these are these are production satellites, but the system itself is in the is still in the beta testing phase they're still um, they're still calling it Starlink beta you know so they have a ton of satellites up there that will have many more tons to come uh, and they ha they have some customers that they've highlighted you know like remote uh, Inuit people or, or residents of far northern you know Alaska or whatever but um, in various remote locations in Canada <clears throat> that have been underserved by, by, uh, you know, with, with crummy internet access for years. Um, but, uh, uh, yeah, they're still calling it beta. So these are, these are the actual production satellites though, that will be, be providing coverage, uh, once they go live, live officially. RTN 480 asks, what time is the Ingenuity test flight on Mars? So as we as I mentioned earlier, no earlier than the 14th, uh, which is Wednesday. Um, but I, I expect it'll be after that, but no earlier than the 14th. So stay tuned for an exact date. Uh, again, that was delayed from the 12th because of that um, unexpected early shutdown of the the uh, high speed rotor test on Friday. Um, Friday, <laughs> speaking of Friday, Friday Ray, um, uh, Lab Padre Nerdle Extraordinaire. Funny how in the early 1990s, they, Chinese, made a huge leap forward. How was that possible? Uh, I am not well versed in the history of Chinese space endeavors, uh, but, um, you know, generally speaking, the Chinese gov government. Uh, when they put their mind to something, are able to, you know, when they get, when they have a goal in their sights, let's say the, you know, the, uh, the Three Gorges Dam or, or whatever, you know, the, 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 um, uh, the Chinese space station or, or whatever their big project is, you know, they can, I mean, because China is basically the manufacturer of the world, uh, most of our stuff is made there, um, they have vast, vast economic resources that they can bring to bear uh, against any, and they have an enormous population, you know, uh, way bigger than the United States uh, or Russia uh, that they can, you know, generate revenue with uh, to throw gobs and gobs of money at uh, uh, whatever project they, they want to work on. So, um, now I don't specifically know the history of, of the Chinese um, space program development of the of the 1990s, but uh, you know, chances are it had something to do with throwing gobs of money at the problem, and also very likely um, building upon established technologies from Russia and the United States, uh, because you know that's 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 just what you do. You take what other people have done, and you um, <clears throat> steal it or enhance it build upon it there you go it's more diplomatic um let's see maria kutajan uh with so many explosions is spacex able to test the heat tiles on the starship belly so if you've noticed uh, i don't have a image up right now but um 
if you've noticed on pictures or videos of SpaceX Starship uh, test articles, there are an increasing number of black tiles on the, on the belly. Those are heat tiles that will be eventually used when um, Starship re-enters uh, re re the Earth's atmosphere from uh, orbit. Because orbital speeds are very fast, you know, it'll be re-entering at roughly 16,000 miles per hour, 17,000 miles per hour. Um, and that the, the heat of, of atmospheric re-entry, you know, reaches 3,500 degrees Fahrenheit, which is quite, quite hot. Um, you know, it's why uh, re-entry systems, uh, capsules, the, the space shuttle, you know, they need very heat absorbent and just and heat uh, re resistant, um, not heat absorbent, but heat resistant uh, materials like reinforced carbon, carbon and, and uh, you know, ablative heat shields and things like that, because there's just an incredible amount of heat generated from the friction of, of plowing through the atmosphere at those kind of speeds. Um, so will they be able to test the heat tiles on, on the Starship belly? So these, these 10 kilometer test flights, uh, they are, you know, descending at maybe a couple hundred miles per hour. Uh, they're not, <laughs> nothing like, you know, or maybe a few hundred miles per hour. You know, they, they don't break the speed of sound even. Um, nothing even remotely approaching uh, what you know the kind of speeds and heat uh, uh, you know profiles that will be encountered when returning from orbit um, so I'm not sure what kind of data they're gathering from the heat shield tiles uh, during these low well during these high altitude test flights <clears throat> but um, but you know the the real test will be uh, you know they can't i mean they can't really they they can test it in a lab you know but in in an actual test flight you can't really do a proper test of a heat shield tile unless you're re-entering the atmosphere because you can't simulate re-entry without re-entering <laughs> you can't go 17,000 miles per hour or whatever the equivalent would be for generating a uh, uh, the same level of heat in one bar of atmosphere versus, you know, whatever micro bars are up at, up at altitude. Um, Tig Rayhoff asks, so what exactly will this helicopter flight tell us on Mars? Uh, this is a really, the, so the Ingenuity drone, here. Hello, I'm Ingenuity. <laughs> the, the Ingenuity drone is um, a really, mostly a proof of concept. It's uh, uh, not, it doesn't really have much of a scientific mission. It's mainly to see if they can do it. You know, it'll be the first um, self-powered flight of any craft on a, a body other than Earth. And uh, that's a big deal. It'll also be flying in an atmosphere which is only a couple of percent the density of Earth's atmosphere. It's very thin, even though it's obviously very dusty. That <clears throat> the the reason that dust is able to persist in the atmosphere is because it's very very fine powder, like baby powder, and it gets everywhere. As we've seen with uh, the other you know rovers, it just gets deposited on on everything really. Um, but uh, uh, so the helicopter flight will tell us whether the con you know whether the the, um, the 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 concept of of having a uh, a helicopter drone on Mars is feasible. Um, you know, theoretically it should be. They've tested this in an, in a vacuum chamber simulating Mars atmospheric density, but. Um, but uh, yeah, it's mostly a proof of concept. So, um, Astro Mint asks, any news on the Kuiper constellation from BO, from Blue Origin? Uh, BO, I presume that means Blue Origin. Uh, Kuiper constellation. I don't know what that is. 
I'll have to look that up. So I don't have any news on, on that because I'm not familiar with that project. Uh, I mean, I know Blue Origin is working on their new Glenn rocket, which is their sort of monster rocket that will compete-ish with, um, with Starship, although only the first stage of New Glenn it will be reusable. The upper stage will be discarded, kind of like uh, the, the Falcon 9s, except much bigger. Um, <clears throat> and they're also working on their BE-4 uh, engines, which are very far along, and they will also be used not, not only on New Glenn, but also on uh, ULA's Vulcan rocket. We'll use uh, Blue Origin BE-4 engines. Um, but uh, uh, but Kuiper Constellation? I'm not familiar with that one. Barrett, random question, but what does the Falcon upper stage use for maneuvering? Well, it depends on where you're talking about it maneuvering. So if it's in space, it uses the RCS thrusters, the cold nitrogen thrusters that, you know, that a lot of spacecraft use to reorient themselves and provide uh, you know, small amounts of thrust uh, to, you know, to uh, uh, change their attitude or, or, or make fine-tune adjustments to their orbital uh, pr uh, trajectory. Uh, of course, the upper stage also has the, the um, <clears throat> uh, Merlin vacuum-optimized engine, which um, provides the main thrust for the upper stage in order to circularize its, uh, like the like recent Starlink launches, they, they have a long coast phase, and then there is a very brief one second, uh, second engine start, restart, um, where they circularize the orbit at the target altitude or the target, you know, uh, trajectory. And then a short time later, there's, there's deployment. Um, but, uh, but yeah, now if you're talking about descent through the atmosphere, uh, maneuvering once it is uh, maneuvering on re-entry and, uh, uh, descent and landing, it uses primarily its, uh, titanium grid fins because as it's going through the atmosphere, those titanium grid fins are able to steer it basically because it's going down through the atmosphere. The grid fins are at the top of the rocket. They act sort of like the rudder of a ship to, um, you know, to steer it through the atmosphere as it, as it descends. Um, they are also able to use the RCS thrusters, and they are also able to use, during the re-entry burn and the landing burn, the gimbling of the single center Raptor engine, um, you know, gimbling meaning the engine, you know, is able to wiggle around and point in different directions, um, uh, thus providing thrust vectoring to, uh, you know, to, to, to write the, the orientation of, of the Falcon rocket so that it's perfectly vertical when it lands. Um, so yes, in space they use the RCS thrusters and uh, the second engine or second, I'm sorry, upper stage, I'm such an idiot. I, I just described the first stage. So, well, that's how the first stage maneuvers. <laughs> yeah, and the upper stage uses RCS thrusters and the 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 uh, vacuum-optimized Merlin engine. I'm sorry, I went off on a, on a tangent. I totally uh, didn't register that you were talking about only the upper stage. So, but you got more answer than you bargained for. So there you go. Uh, Sam Valashek, uh, source of the cost is from Gwen Shotwell. Um, <laughs> what does she know? She only runs SpaceX. Um, so that's a pretty good, that's a pretty good source. Can't really get any better than that. In fact, I would say, uh, I would, I would trust, uh, not trust, but I would, um, uh, take the word of Gwyn Shotwell uh, at face value, probably uh, with less, even less hesitation than if it came from the lips or the fingers of Elon Musk. So, um, ah, Musk is going to hear me say that and blackball me. So, oh well. 
Um, Scott Montoya, Raw Space, do you think that SN15 will launch this month? Um, I would think so. They even, you know, even when they have RUDs or, or um, explosions, they have been proceeding at a pretty rapid pace with the um, launching of Starship SN prototypes. Uh, so I, I would think that SN15 would launch probably within the next couple of weeks. And I have no idea what the current status of the, of the launch pad or the, assemb the uh, assembly facilities there in Boca Chica are. I haven't been keeping, keeping track of that, am that amidst this move of mine. But, um, but yeah, I think they would launch pretty soon. Crystallina Bacteria. Do you think the ISS is too overcrowded? and health and safety issues. So currently there are actually 10 people on the ISS. Uh, that's the most there have been in a long time. There have actually been more than that. Uh, there have been up to 11, maybe even up to 13 in the past uh, during uh, the space shuttle era while the space shuttle was docked to the ISS. Um, but those were not uh, uh, again, you know, the space shuttle didn't remain docked for long periods of time. It would only be there for like a week or two, you know, um, uh, you know before bringing down another batch of, of astronauts and cosmonauts. Um, but uh, I don't think it's too overcrowded. I mean, they have eight uh, built-in sleeping pods on the ISS. And the remaining three people have to sort of, you know, find a find a quiet spot and, and you know, set up their sleeping bag. I mean, the ISS is uh, packed full of stuff. Like every corner of that space station has, um, you know, bags and boxes, not boxes, but bags and and just stowage everywhere. And so there's lots of places to attach a sleeping pod or a sleeping uh, bag, um, you know. So it's maybe a little bit crowded, but it's the, I mean, it's the size of a six-room house. It's a large uh, structure, so, uh, you know, I don't think that they're feeling too cramped. Um, and as far as health and safety, I don't think there'd be any health and safety issues at all. The systems are very capable of of handling that population of people. And it won't have that many people on the ISS for very long because in a few days, later this week, uh, three of them will be uh, uh, deorbiting on Soyuz MS-17. So, uh, let's see, moving on. Friday Ray, at, oh, he says, thanks, Ra, thanks. You're quite welcome. Latanya Smithy. Uh, very good to see you back and healthy um, uh, on the channel. Uh, valued regular on this channel, she is. Um, and uh, yeah, so it's really good to see you here. Uh, she says, thanks for everything you do. And uh, thank you for, for, for saying that. Uh, you are why I am here. <laughs> you and, and all the rest of you. Um, so yeah, I love space. Whether or not whether or not this channel exists, I, I have and always will love space. Um, but I just figured, you know, I would share my love with y'all, um, such as I can, <laughs> amidst my my crazy schedule. MVM Motovlog Music. Uh, oh, okay. Thank you again for the compliment. Uh, apparently, I'm great, really great. Um, so. I need to read these before I speak them because uh, I don't want to sound like I'm congratulating myself. Um, uh, ah, yes, MVM Motovlog Music wishes me a thousand years of happy. Um, it, you know, I would rather have a thousand years of happy than a thousand years of being digested by the almighty Sarlacc. <laughs> but, uh, all right. So... Uh, looks like that will do it for this week. Look at that, we got 98 viewers. Oh, oh down to 75. Um, uh, so some folks have asked about Bennu. Uh, he is loving the new house. He has lots of places to explore. 
Um, he tears up and down the stairs, which are actually the only carpeted parts of the house. Um, I have his his cat tower set up in the corner of the living room with with like a big like panoramic window on either side of him, so he gets great views of the outside. And we were right next to a forest, so there's lots of birds and squirrels and bugs for him to freak out about. Um, and uh, uh, yeah, so Ben is doing well. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have Benu Cam set up for you yet. I'm probably going to set it up over by his cat tower, which is in the other room because he likes to, to hang out there. But um, I've got to figure out how to do that because that's not near my computer. It's near a different computer. Um, but when I get that set up, I'll definitely bring Benu Cam back online for you. Until then, keep it raw, and um, I hope to see you in um, the next live stream. Uh, thanks for coming, and until next time, bye-bye.